Welcome, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights Outtakes with uh, Brad Bethune's Card Time Show. The, these are some of the comments that I thought were, as I've always said, non-duplicative for things I've already talked about in 600-odd episodes here. So thanks, Brad, uh, for asking some good questions and uh, taking it down a certain road. Uh, you could certainly go to his for the whole thing. But thanks, to Top Spinini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, ComC.com, and Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. There's lots of different ways to have a corporate structure from a sole proprietorship to a limited partnership to a, a sub-S corporation or a C-Corp. And the person that organizes it can decide, I want an LLC, or I want a partnership, or I want a limited partnership. It, it would be based on the tax advantages and the, the governance. How do you vote? How do you decide what to do? When I started a card shop with a couple other guys, the, the three of us were equal partners. So it took two out of three. We rarely disagreed. The best thing to do is pick great partners. Then you don't have to worry too much, but I had great partners. And so we were rarely in disagreement about selling something or whatever. We were pretty easy going. But if you had 100 co-op members, taking a vote on things could be pretty cumbersome. What happens in the fractional space now is that people are buying certain shares of a really good card, but they can buy more than one. And then the voting is pro rata, just like in regular stock market. If you're voting on a proposal, you get a weighted vote according to how many shares you have. I just think if I went to Panini or Tops or Upper Deck and I was an LCS and I said, here's my list of 100 customers who have guaranteed they are going to be consistent customers and they've paid me in advance this much money so that I want to get enough product from you, the card company, to fulfill these customers. They each want a box or they each want a pack or they each want, a, not a case, but there's some allocation that they really want. For hockey, this is much what we're going to need because so many of them are hockey for basketball, for football, for baseball. And I think it'd be compelling. Now, the problem is you couldn't tell the card companies and here are the addresses, here are their phone numbers, because they could jump around you. But I think that's the fear of the card companies to give direct account to somebody that doesn't really have a store. It's really just yeah. going to flip it online. Yeah. But if you really were going to be a local card shop and get the cards broken up and into the hands of local collectors there that you're really serving, that'd be compelling. I'd try to go the extra mile if I were the card company to try to make sure card shops that had loyal clientele had a regular stream of product. That's healthy for the hobby. And when Fanatics comes in, maybe they'll take a fresh look at that. The card companies want to sell product, but if they were to sell too much to individuals, then it's going to be to the detriment of the card shops. And so if you're in a town that has a good card shop, I think the card company should want you to shop at Triple Cards or Nick's if you're around the DFW. But there's some good card shops and you should go there. But it's just hard to police. But yeah. if you could pick up a box direct, I think people are doing that. If the price is marked up, if the dealers could get it a little bit cheaper or a little bit faster, that's the dilemma we had when we were doing our magazines is that the subscription cost and the dealer, sometimes there could be an edge one way or the other, but we tried to make it so the dealers got it at least as soon as the collectors. So the dealers yeah. would at least not be at a disadvantage. Yeah. Because we wanted people going to the local card shop. That's healthy for the industry. I don't think the card companies want to deal with a group of card shops except through the distributors. And the distributors are, you know, in an awkward position because mm -hmm. they get it for a certain price and then they sell it. But if they're expected to get more, they have to go to the open market and then they've got to pay more and then they're going to mark it up. So you've really got to be savvy to where prices are going. Uh, I think it's hard. And yeah, it's dynamic. It's dynamic is not bad, but I, I just don't like the local card shops to get squeezed out. The main goal was for LCS owners to find a way to build good community so people could go to them versus the big box retail or online. But I think pricing of new card products is a function of time. If you get the first wave, if you get it from the source, the original SRP, then it works off that. If it's a bad product, you could get it cheaper later. But lately, so many things have gone up. Any individual customer that got it direct may have gotten it cheaper if they got it in the original flow than the dealer got from the distributor two weeks later because they're at the mercy of the secondary market. Things generally have been going up, but that's better than if they're going down. But that means it didn't sell very well. Yeah. And that means maybe your customers don't want it. Now, I would hope they'd still want it because it's a product that's selling for less than the SRP. 
what does that mean? The Panini and Thompson Upper Deck, they packed it out so they thought there would be value at that price point. And so if it goes 20% lower, it ought to be a better deal. But if people have given up on that rookie class or they didn't like the, the design or something, but it can come back in favor. And some rookie that was given up on could later turn out to be great. So yeah. there's just no sure things. Even if a small percentage of the dues collectively went to support Little League teams or sports tournament, outreach is just is lacking in the LCSs, and they could be a lot more proactive. Again, if you're Panini and Tops and Upper Deck or Leaf or any of them that are considering having direct accounts of card store and the application, it ought to be maybe your creditworthiness or your customer base. But if they're doing things in the community, to me, that's a huge plus because they're probably going to be around if they're active in the community and giving back. And people are going to come, and they're probably going to have a long-term future in that store. It's just a better way to do business. What can we do to keep attracting more kids into the hobby other than just building sets for them? I don't even know that building sets for them is the number one thing. The kids that I've known over the years, want to, the little kids want to collect what the big kids collect. And they want to aspire to that, and they got to work their way up. But to have just a kid's product only, I don't think they hold that in high regard if the adults in their life think, oh, that's just a kid's product. It's not a big deal. So I'm not in favor of a kid's product that's that's dumbed down just for kids. Mm -hmm. I'm in favor of a product that's produced in enough quantity that the price is not going to run away and kids can open and enjoy and occasionally get a good card, but they'd complete a set or they'd be able to get lots of different versions of their favorite players. So I, I don't think they have to huge grail cards to be satisfied. They, they ought to start and work their way up. And, and some of these teenagers and 20-somethings, they're kids to me, they've figured out how to play the game. Just get in the game, start trading up, try to gain an advantage. And when I see kids at the shows, they're walking around with their cards that they have, asking the dealers or other people to show, are you interested in buying? And they know exactly what they have in the card and they're pretty tuned into the market. So they're looking to trade or sell to a dealer and to gain an advantage. Mm -hmm. and, and it's pretty amazing. And they, they, a lot of dealers, frankly, will give the kids the benefit of the doubt. Oh, sure, kid. I'll, yeah, I'll do that. And so they'll make an extra good deal for a kid. And the kid just traded a $100 card for a $150 card. But the week before, it was a $50 card for a $75 card or a $20 card for a $30 card. These kids are smart. In many cases, they've done more homework than the adult. What do you think has been the hobby's greatest achievement? What I'd go by, Brad, is how much has card collecting moved into the public's consciousness? On the front page of the sports page or the, the local paper or the USA Today, any mentions in major media, how much action are cards getting in the now social media? The, the higher profile of collecting is what I would measure. And it's by mentions, and I'll see somebody and they'll say, oh, yeah, you did baseball cards, and boy, they sure are hot now. So there's a general awareness. In the 70s, people said, oh, yeah, I heard there's been some card shows now or something. But it wasn't mainstream. It was just, yeah, that's a legitimate hobby. But now it's a legitimate business or it's a legitimate way to make a lot of money because that's the headlines you're reading. Having greater visibility for the hobby is what I think is important. Because I said it's the greatest hobby of all time. I think the hobby saved a lot of people's mental health during COVID. It gave people a purpose, a community at a time when lots of people's lives were rocked. Has there been a time in the hobby where there's been this togetherness in the hobby in the past? No, there was more togetherness in the 70s because it was so small. It was like an extended <laughs> family reunion. You went to these card shows. Everybody yeah. knew everybody. They knew them in person, not just virtually. They were. Uh, they, they, it was a much smaller circle. Yeah. Uh, so you could know everybody. And then it, it got impersonal when they had the growth period of the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. And now I think COVID has increased the desire for people to connect. What's up with the 1987 Topps Barry Bonds card? There's about 16,000 on the PSA pop report. 1,400 tens, 5,000 nines, 7,000 eights. And prices, an average of 450 sold eBay, and then, you know, all the way down to 30 bucks. For an 87 Barry Bonds that was considered like one of the most common cards 
ever made. That just seems out of whack to me where you've got an 87 Barry Bonds going for 400 to 500 dollars for a card uh, i wouldn't pay that much but i'm just one person apparently there are enough people who will but uh, number one 87 very overproduced uh, not the greatest quality control so you showed it the gem rate or the cards of the last few years more than half of them are tens it seems or 9.5s but in yeah. 87 it wasn't that way and so that's part of the junk wax if they open up the wax of 87 tops and they pull out an untouched Barry Bonds, it's arguably uh, what we used to call kind of an RC asterisk mm -hmm. because 87 really is his first full year of regular issue in the pack cards and not traded or update uh, cards. Anybody around in 87 knows that is not a tough card. Yeah. And that, to pay a huge premium for a 10 over a 9 over an 8 for a card that there might be a million of them out there. There's certainly many hundreds of thousands of that card in existence. I just found it odd that, that a PSA 10 or even just that card would garter more than five bucks or whatever the going rate is. It's supply and demand. On the other hand, would you pay 10 bucks for a raw version? I'm not so sure unless you really scrutinized it. Yeah. So, yeah, well, you know, well, Ben Wilson well, famously has six or 787 Maguires. Yeah. Because he's convinced that's, in his mind, the true rookie card. First, you know, card in an A's big league uniform. Yeah. So I understand that reasoning, but he hasn't had that much trouble accumulating hundreds of those. Bonds going to the Hall of Fame? Wait and see. I don't know. Eventually, uh, I, I, I think he has to get in. Yeah. Because he was a Hall of Famer before, just based on before he did what he supposedly did. Power and speed, regardless of what you're doing, hitting the ball on the nose <laughs> and putting it out and walking and he's uh, stealing all his bases back when he was fast. Uh, I, I think he eventually gets in. With his statistics, some of the things he did uh, were unprecedented. And now they're tainted, but he's still, oh, man. Now, I think he gets in on Veterans Committee. Cooler heads will prevail. What would you say would be great tools for learning about the history of cards in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. For someone who's getting into or returning back from the hobby to learn about what's going on. Uh, there's blogs, there's uh, publications. It might be fun to get an old publication, just look through it <laughs> to see what cards used to sell for in the simpler, older days. There's podcasts, there's YouTube. There's some good books out there that talk about the bubblegum war. Just do some homework or talk to an older guy at a, at a show. I am talking to an older guy. Yeah, you better. <laughs> I thought about it for a second, but I just had to let it go. Starting Beckett Magazine. Was it to promote the hobby, to level the playing field? I think the direction I was going with the magazine, leveling the playing field was more a statement about the first books, mm -hmm. because then there was nothing. And so to put a book that really identified the price of every card and every set in the various annual price guide books, that leveled the playing field. Mm -hmm. But what the magazines did was provide a dynamic element of movement month to month and drawing people into the card shops to see that this was a, a hobby that had a dynamic element, that it wasn't just getting your annual price guide once a year, those were the prices, check back next year. There was more and more of a feeling that what was going on the field and the understood scarcities of the products led to price increases and decreases. Mm -hmm. So the magazines were more about that dynamic element. The books were more about leveling the playing field. And they were five years apart. 79 was the books, and 84 was the first monthly magazine of baseball. Later. The man in the house of cards. The man in the house of cards. The man in the house of cards. Is doing.